and trying to wring out all the tears I could this morning and yesterday and these past few weeks. And the more I twist and turn, the more I find comes out. It's not running dry. I guess I can just thank God for it, that that well springing up inside of me is flowing strong. On the slides before you, you see two statements. He is risen. He is risen indeed. By a show of hands, who's familiar with these statements? that you've heard them before stated this way because whether you know it or not many churches all across the nation begin their Easter service with these statements whoever's preaching will say he is risen and the congregation will respond he is risen indeed and they'll do it and it'll reach a high crescendo Sometimes the, the sound is deafening. But I worry sometimes that it's done out of routine so much that people lose the impact and instead have just grabbed the routine and the ritual instead of what the statements mean and how weighty they are. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I don't know if some of you might be attending your first Easter service today. That could be the case. Some of you may have attended one. Some of you have, may have attended 50 or more. And in these Easter services and these Easter messages, whether it's one, fifty, or, or none, you might not have heard the Easter message, or maybe worse, you heard it, and you think you know it all already and don't need to hear it again. I don't know where you're coming from or what your experience has been, but I know that today it's my responsibility to bring forth this Easter message. And I've felt the weight of it for weeks. And it's been crushing me. And I only pray and hope that what's occurred has been to your profit. That it will benefit you, that God's Word will get to you and that He will reach you today with that message like He's never done before. The next slide is going to show you passages from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that I'll be speaking about next. See, in the ver first seven verses of each of those passages, we have summary statements. Summary statements that tell us about the women who came to the tomb where Jesus had been buried early that Sunday morning following the Sabbath. These summaries collectively tell the same story but they do so from a unique perspective so that in each rendering you have details that are not rendered in the other Gospels. So you get a different perspective of that viewpoint of something they saw that wasn't relayed in one of the other Gospels. Each account summarizes the event but that unique perspective that they each deliver also provides details that give us a unique understanding of the weight of the event. From these accounts, 
we know that the women were coming very early in the morning to anoint the body of Jesus. They came with spices, with ointments, and they came because that was their custom to embalm the body. And they had not gotten to because of the Sabbath coming when he was crucified. So they couldn't do that then. So they came afterwards to anoint his body. And as they made their way to the tomb, they wondered how they would access it because they knew that a great stone had been rolled in front of the tomb, sealing it, that there were guards and a seal set upon the tomb so that they could not enter. And they questioned among themselves, who will roll this stone away for us? In this gospel account from Matthew, it tells us that there was a large, a great earthquake because an angel had descended from heaven and rolled the stone away. It also tells us that the keepers of the tomb shook with fear and became as dead men. It does not say that they died. They became as dead men, meaning they did not move. They did not speak. They were present when the women arrived, but they did not engage the women, and the women did not engage them. The women arrived at the tomb and were surprised by the fact that the stone had been rolled away. And the gospel accounts tell us that they entered the tomb. They found that the body of Jesus was not there. Luke's account tells us that when they had gone into the tomb, they were greeted by two men in shining garments. And they were filled with fear so that they fell down and bowed down before them. And the women were asked by these figures, why were you looking? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? The women were reminded by these two individuals how Jesus had told them before in Galilee how he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. The angel said, he is risen. They instructed the women to go inform his disciples and Peter that he is risen and that he had gone before them into Galilee and they would see him there. In preparation for this message, the last few weeks, three words beginning with R caused me to struggle, wrestle mentally. The first of these words was relevant. When I looked at the Oxford Online Dictionary for the definition of relevant, this is what they wrote. Closely connected or appropriate to what is being done or considered. Appropriate for the current time, the current period, or circumstances or of contemporary interest. Let me see if I can simplify that. In other words, appropriate for right now, for what we're doing, something that matters here and now. The second word is relate. And the dictionary definition out of the Oxford Online Dictionary says that means to make or show a connection between. The last word is relative. The, de the definition they gave for that word was considered in relation or in proportion to something else. Existing or possessing a specified characteristic only in comparison to something else. Not absolute. In other words, if something is relative, it can change depending on who is observing it and how they're observing it. It can't stand alone. It's completely dependent on something else. These words, they may not be troubling to you. They were to me. And I'm hoping I can illustrate the reasons why. You see, relevant means 
it matters. Right here, right now. And while I know that what I'm speaking to you about matters, I can't guarantee that it's going to matter to you. That's up to you. Relate was difficult because while I can make or show a connection between things, I can't make it relate to you. Let me give you an example. I can introduce a person to you. I can walk up and say, this is so-and-so, give you their name, their occupation. I could give you their whole life history. But I can't establish a relation to you. Only you can create that relation. So you determine whether it relates to you or not. I can only introduce. The last word, relative, the difficulty that posed was because relative by definition, is something that can change based on its observation. Who is observing it and how they're observing it. Each of you listening right now are coming from different backgrounds, different levels of education, different levels of understanding, different levels of knowledge of what's in the Scripture. Everyone has a different perspective, even those of you in the same household. That's how unique you are. The reason this became overwhelming is because I was looking at this and going, this is impossible. I can't do this. I can't make something relevant. No matter what I say, no matter what I do, I can't make anything matter to you. I can't make it relate to you. I can't make you relate to it. And I can't know or address exactly where each and every one of you are coming from. I'm not able. I'm severely lacking to ever hope to accomplish that. And at the, the end of that crushing experience, the Comforter, God's Holy Spirit, He had me right where He wanted me. He made it clear that it wasn't my job to do those things. See, I'm here to bring the truth of God's word to you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Is that truth? The truth is always relevant. No amount of time that passes by changes that. It's relevant then, it's relevant now, and it always will be relevant. It is the most relevant thing you will ever know, that He is risen. He is risen indeed. And I don't have to make that relate to you, and I don't have to make you relate to it. I just have to put it out before you. Now you have the responsibility. You have to decide how it relates to you. When I give you the truth, it's up to you to either agree with God and stand there or disagree with God and oppose Him. I don't make that choice for you. You do. The world around us tells us that truth is relative. There are no absolute truths, they say. They'll sing, say things to you like, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. And that's wrong. It's a lie from the very pit of hell. Truth does not change 
it is not dependent on who we are or how we look at it. I'll give you a simple illustration. A little math fact you may remember from long ago. One times one equals one. Now it's up on the screen for all to see. But depending on your vantage point or the acuity level of your vision, that may or may not be clear. The other thing that factors in there is that some of you may be looking with both eyes open, and some of you may be looking through one eye because you're dot nodding off and dozing off, and every time I get a little bit louder, you snap out of it, and you're looking through one eye. Some people might even be looking at it cross-eyed because they have no idea where I'm going right now. And some may be choosing to close their eyes because they're saying it's not important to them. Or maybe some other reason is they didn't get enough sleep last night and they thought, well, here's a nice place to nap. I'll, I'll catch my winks here. None of those perspectives matter. The truth is one times one equals one. No matter where you're looking at it from, how you're looking at it, or if you're looking at it at all. The truth just is. Whether we agree with it only has a consequence for us. The truth won't suffer. It'll stand long after every one of us falls down. It will stand forever. God's word says so. Today, one truth is that we may not have another Easter together. We may not see another Easter at all. We don't know that at the end of this day, whether some of us might have breathed our last breaths because we don't see that far ahead. So understanding that, the weight is grave. I have to approach this message as if it's the last one you'll ever hear and that you may never hear it again. Before you leave those doors, the message has to be clear. In your bulletin, you have the title of this message along with three questions. Who is he? Why was he crucified? And what does it all mean, matter, or accomplish? And I'm going to give you some simple answers right now, but we're going to work through a weightier answer. Who is he? Simply, he that was crucified. Why was he crucified? Well, it was according to God's plan, and it was entirely necessary that he was crucified to accomplish it. What does it all mean, matter, or accomplish? It means that God had a plan. It matters because he is almighty God, and it accomplishes all he intends to. But again, those just briefly scratch the surface of how these questions are really answered. Before we answer them more fully, I'm going to take you on an exodus through the book of Exodus, at least a portion of it, chapters 3 through 14. And I'm going to try to go fast, but not so fast that you won't think you've got to raise a paddle to say that you'll buy that item just so that you can follow. We, we don't want to have an auction event here. See, in the book of Exodus, chapters 3 through 14, we read of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. In chapter 3, God approaches Moses, and he tells him, I want you to go 
tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And uh, Moses isn't quite ready to comply. A little reluctant. They're not going to listen to me. He's not going to hear me. God says, it's okay. I'll be with you. But he still says, who am I that I should go and tell Pharaoh? He says, don't worry. I'll be with you. You're going to tell him what I'll tell you. And I'm going to make you do certain things. But he's not going to want to let you go. Not even by a strong hand will he want to let you go. And that's because that will allow me to lay my hand upon Egypt and deliver my people. And when you leave Egypt, you will not leave empty-handed. You will spoil the Egyptians. You will plunder them and leave with your hands full. And what comes to mind when I read this passage of Scripture is that Zechariah 4.6 tells us in that passage that the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel and it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's who's going to be delivering Israel from Egypt. The spirit of the Lord. Not man's might. So in chapter 4 of Exodus, Moses is looking for any way out of this. How can I escape this? How can I get out of this responsibility? Moses says no. God says to Moses, no, you're going. And you're going to do this. And he gives them two signs that he's going to show the people at first. One, he had a staff in his hand. And he says, throw it on the ground. And it became a snake before him. Got a little afraid. He says, now grab it by the tail. Everybody here be going, what? So he grabs it by the tail. It returned to a staff. And he says, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom and he drew it out and it became leprous. And he put it back in, put it back in, take it out and it became clean. And he says, you will show the people this. So Moses went, met his brother Aaron and they went to the people. And when they told the people and showed them the signs, the Israelites believed. They knew at that moment that God had heard their cries. They believed and worshipped. Chapter 5, Moses goes to Pharaoh with Aaron. Goes to appear and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, get out of here. You just made their work harder. And he removes the straw from the brick making that they were doing and has to make them make bricks without straw. So the burdens became more difficult because they weren't allowed to drop their production. They still had to keep up with production demands, but the labor was harder. <coughs> Excuse me. Pharaoh sends Moses and Aaron away, makes the work harder. Moses goes back to the people. The Israelites are upset with him and Aaron. He runs to God. He says, why did you do this to me? They hate me. The people were mad because he made their work harder. That's how they saw it. God says, go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my people go. And he's going to ask you to show him some miracle or wonder. Give him proof of who you are. So Moses and Aaron go back. And that's when you read of Moses and Aaron being in there and they have to put down the staff and the serpent comes out. But there were some magicians there. And they copied that. And they made their sticks snakes. But there was something different about the snake that Moses and Aaron brought. It says... Their rod swallowed the Egyptians' rods. At this moment, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Later, 
Moses turns the waters to blood. But the magicians are back in the picture and they copy that feat. The next miracle Moses is told to do is call forth frogs from the river. And he calls forth the frogs and then the magicians say, hey, we can do that trick. We're going to call frogs too. Egypt's full of frogs. But something changes here. See, Pharaoh goes to Moses and say, hey, take the frogs away. I'll, I'll let you go. So Moses goes to God and says, please remove the frogs. Frogs are removed. Pharaoh stands back. Fooled you. Not really going to do it. So then God brings swarms of flies in Egypt. And Pharaoh goes back into bargaining mode. Okay, just worship your God here. And Moses says, we can't do that here. We need to go. So he says, okay, just get rid of the flies and you can go. Gets rid of the flies. No, nah, no, nah, I, I was rethinking things. Not going to let you go. So then they're commanded to bring forth lice. See, they were called and they sit, take handfuls of ashes and to throw them in the air in Pharaoh's sight. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Raises, Aaron raises his hand, calls forth lice. Lice come through the land, but the magicians, they say, uh, we can't do that one. And that's the last time they tried to attempt the miracles. So Pharaoh asks to remove the lice. I mean, the, the lice. Please forgive me. When the magician said, we can't do this, they made the comment, this is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. They attributed it to something other than Moses. One, I don't think it's because they believed. We see that later. But it's because they needed an excuse to Pharaoh of why they couldn't copy it. Okay? Otherwise, they're on the chopping block. We can't do this. It's the finger of God. So God issues another warning to Pharaoh. And he says, Let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, but, but if you get rid of them, I will. He says, if you don't let my people go, I will bring another plague upon you. My hand will be upon your cattle, your horses, your donkeys, camels, oxen, and sheep. There will be a very grievous disease, and the Lord will separate the cattle of Egypt and the cattle of Israel so that nothing at all shall die of the cattle of Israel. Nothing at all. Pharaoh didn't let them go. So the next day, a disease overwhelmed his cattle, and they died. But none of Israel's cattle in the land of Goshen were harmed. Then the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, I told you I got ahead of myself, commanded them to grab the handfuls of ash and sprinkle them in the air in front of Pharaoh. And it would cause boils to come upon the animals and the people. And they did this, and now the magicians aren't even standing by to watch what they can't copy. They're covered in boils. They can't even stand in front of Moses anymore because of the boils. They're out of the picture. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened yet again, and he did not let the people go. So the Lord commanded Moses to rise up early in the morning, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. All my plagues will be upon your house, your servants, your people, that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. Because I raised you up for this, to show my power, that my name might be declared through all, all the earth. And you still exalt yourself above my people so that you would not let them go? Tomorrow I will cause it to hail as never before in Egypt. 
Gather your beasts out of the field, for any beasts that are in the field, when the hail comes, they will die by the hail. And God commanded Moses to stretch forth his hand, and hail and fire came. And every beast or person that was out in the field were smote by the hail. Plants, crops laid waste. The only thing not laid waste was the wheat and the rye because it had not yet sprung forth from the ground. And this brought a new response from Pharaoh. He sent for Moses and Aaron again, and he said unto them, I have sinned this time. This time I sinned. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Make request of the Lord that there be no more thunderings and hail. It's enough. I'll let you go. You'll stay no longer. And Moses said, As soon as I leave this city, I will spread my hands to the Lord, and the hail and thunder shall cease, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your servants will not yet fear the Lord God. God sent Moses to speak to Pharaoh, and Moses asked, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before the Lord? Let my people go, that they may serve me. If you will not let them go, I will bring locusts into your coast tomorrow. They shall fill the land so that you shall not even be able to see the ground. Pharaoh didn't listen. The locusts swarmed as never before. And any green thing that was left in the field from the hail was now gone because the locusts devoured it. Their crops decimated. Pharaoh comes back. New words this time. Because he had a little peer pressure. His servants came to him and said, why are you letting this man be a snare to us? Let them go. Let the men go and worship. Don't you see that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses goes running. Uh, Aaron, uh, Pharaoh goes running to Moses and Aaron. And he says, Okay, who is it that shall go? Moses says, All of us. Women, children, livestock. He goes, no, 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 not so fast. Just you and the men. That's who wanted to go. Go. And he leaves. But after these crops are decimated, he comes running again. And he says, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, forgive. And these next words show that the repentance wasn't truly there. This was the type of remorse that comes from somebody getting caught when they did a crime, and they're only sorry because they got caught. It's not that they've changed their mind and they don't want to do things anymore. He says, forgive, I pray you, my sin only this once. Ask the Lord your God that he may take away this death only from me. And Moses went out and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord caused a mighty strong west wind that removed the locusts. But still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened more, and he did not let the people go. So God commanded Moses to stretch forth his hand towards heaven, that darkness would be over the land. Darkness like never before, darkness so dark that it would be felt. So for three days, a thick darkness was over the land of Egypt so that they couldn't even see each other. They didn't go outside of their homes, but yet in the dwelling places of the Israelites, there was light. Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, you and your little ones, serve the Lord, but leave your flocks and herds behind. Moses said, You must give us sacrifices and bird offerings. We don't even know what we're going to worship God with yet. We need to take it with us. We won't know until we're there. Pharaoh says, fine, leave, take it all, 
you're not going to see my face again because the next time you see my face, you will surely die. And Moses says, you've got part of that, right? I'm not going to see your face again. He said that the Lord will pass through the land and all the firstborn of Egypt will die, both man and beast, so that you may know that the Lord has separated Israel from Egypt. Moses continued, all your servants shall come to me and bow down and say, leave you, your people, and all that follow after you, leave. Leave. And he left Pharaoh in anger. It was then that God established the Passover. And this Passover ceremony and feast was a feast where they had to sacrifice lamb. And they were to eat the meal in haste. Lamb and unleavened bread. And they were to take the blood of the lamb and to sprinkle it on the lentil and the posts of their doors. And that when the Lord passed through Egypt that night, every home that was not covered by the blood of the Lamb would suffer death. The firstborn, man and beast, would perish. And there was nothing they could do to stop it. Nothing on this earth could stop it but the blood of the Lamb. God was setting the stage for his dear son to come many years later. Through these events, we learn some things about the character of God and of Pharaoh. God hears the cries of his people, and he answers those cries with promises. He warns those that oppose him of judgment, and he offers opportunities for repentance. God shows justice because he judges those that oppose him, and he shows mercy because he spares the repentant. God delivers his people through trials, and God keeps his word. But we learn some things about the nature and character of Pharaoh as well. Pharaoh was not merciful, he was not just, he was unrepentant. He did not keep his word. He only sought God when he wanted a reprieve from the punishment he was delivering. He tried to bargain with God and say, I'll do this if you do that. And he was a people pleaser instead of a person trying to please God. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says that these things happened for examples. They're written for our instruction, our admonition, to whom the ends of the world have come. We're supposed to look on our past and learn from it. God performed many signs, many miracles and wonders in Egypt. He brought judgment, but he showed mercy. He brought trouble, but he also brought deliverance. He did it by bringing the truth. And depending on what side each person chose to stand upon, they either suffered or were delivered. It was all a picture of what was to come with Christ when God would send his chosen deliverer to spare the world from judgment. John 1.29 tells us that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's His blood that you must be protected by. And if His blood has not covered you, you have not received Him as your Lord and Savior. Right now, you stand waiting under the wrath of God. And you may not have another day another tomorrow to change your mind. So it's this day that is the day of salvation. It's this day if you will hear his voice. It's this day that salvation has come to you. It's this day 
we beg that you believe because he's coming. He promises he will return and he keeps his word. His word is true. And you stand in jeopardy every moment of your life that you stand without Christ. So if you do not know him, beg him today to save you by the precious blood of his son which was shed upon Calvary's cross for you because he was crucified to be our savior but he was raised to be our king and he is risen he is risen indeed he is risen This message didn't rise up in the disciples' hearts like Pharaoh. Even they suffered from hardened hearts. The Jews did not believe Jesus was coming. They did not believe the words to be true, no matter how many miracles were done before their eyes. When he was crucified, the disciples went into hiding. They were terrified. They locked themselves in homes, worried they're next. The women came to the tomb to anoint the body because they did not believe he was risen. Even when he was risen, for 40 days he dwelt among them. They cowered in fear still many of those 40 days until one day Jesus had to come back and put him back on track. And he met him on the shore. And he had a little breakfast with him after they had gone out fishing, trying to return to the life they lived before they knew him. In Luke 24, we read of the account of some of the last words Jesus spoke to him before he ascended. And said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And it came to pass when he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up to heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. See, his physical resurrection didn't yet hit them in their heart. They still did not fully believe. But things change when he ascended. Because when he ascended, he ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. Ten days later at the day of Pentecost, the church received a gift from God. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And after that day, it would never be the same. That's the day that the apostles and the disciples were changed forever. That's the day that he is risen. He is risen indeed, came alive in their hearts. Because after that moment, they preached the gospel of God, knowing that persecutions would come People would beat, imprison, and even kill them. And yet they gladly went out and preached the word. 
they gladly went out and told everyone they found who Jesus was and that he's risen. So who is Jesus? He that was crucified. But he was fully man so that he could be our complete substitution and die for us. He was fully God so that his righteousness would not per permit or allow the grave to hold him. He was the Messiah foreordained and sent to save sinners. He was the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, and he was the great high priest that offered that sacrifice. Why was he crucified? Sin requires judgment, and God, who is just, must execute that judgment because of who he is. He judged sin on that cross, but instead of judgment falling upon us who deserved it, it was laid upon his dear son, his embodied word to take the judgment for us. Because the Bible tells us that God so loved the world, so loved the world that he gave his son, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life because God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And what does it all mean? What does it matter? What does it accomplish? It means the greatest gift of all has been given so that our greatest need might be met. What does that matter? It matters that because while we are powerless to save ourselves from sin, Almighty God stepped in in the person of Jesus Christ and saved us for us delivering us from sin and death, delivering us from the shame forever to dwell with him. What does it accomplish? It accomplishes what we couldn't do on our own. It's a complete satisfaction and an appeasement of God's wrath towards sin. It delivers us completely, not partially, there's not a part you've got to keep up. Believe and be saved. Believe and be saved. He was crucified to be our Savior. He is risen to be our King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords forevermore. But is he your King? Is he your Lord? Has he risen in you? Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for these people, and I pray, Lord, that you would not allow one of them to leave this place without Christ in their hearts. If there is someone that doesn't know you here. Let them know they are not beyond your reach and they can come. Let them call upon you if they need help. Let them come forward and let us pray with them. Lord, we care that you save the lost and we do not want any lost person to leave this place. We desire, Lord, what you desire, that all would come to repentance, that all would be saved. Let it be so here. Let it be so now. Let it be so forevermore, Lord. Let your name be glorified in all the earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.